Welcome and greetings to our distinguished panelists and to our audience from across Europe and around the world. My name is Mark Brown. I serve as vice chair of the Universal Peace Federation, Europe and the Middle East and executive director of the Univ International Summit Council for World Peace, who hosts of this webinar. It's my honor to introduce uh, this important webinar and its distinguished moderator, Dr. Faselabend. But first, a couple of technical explanations. Uh, first of all, on translation, we uh, will be conducting the webinar in English, but however, there will be translation available into Russian and French. And if you require this, please click on the globe that you will see on the lower right hand side of your screen and choose Russian or French as the case may be from the menu that appears. Secondly, on questions, we welcome them from the audience. And if you have questions for our distinguished panel, please send them using the Q&A button that you will see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, obviously, our time for questions will be limited, but we will try to include as many as possible in the program. Mm. Now, just a few words of introduction to this webinar that help put it into its true context. UPS founders, Father and Mother Moon, have always been people of extraordinary vision and prescience often predicting world events far in advance of their actual occurrence. In 1985, at a global conference in Geneva of most of the world's most eminent Sovietologists, they predicted that the breakup of the Soviet Union was at hand and would occur within four to five years, and that we all needed to be prepared. This was a warning to the world to enable it to prepare as best it could for that eventuality. Most people's reaction was skeptical, but happen it did, and within the time frame predicted. Recently, Mother Moon has been predicting that the process towards the reunification of the Korean Peninsula would start soon, as early as 2022, and that the world would do well to prepare for that as much in advance as possible. So in 2020, uh, last year, in fact, to help this process, she initiated a global working group of experts from all fields of study having a bearing on how this could be achieved, politics, diplomacy, strategic studies, business, economics, sports, the arts, and so on. The big idea behind this initiative is to pool the wisdom of all these experts and to make available to all of those opinion leaders and decision makers with any influence over Korean affairs, the greatest possible amount of wisdom as to how this could be achieved in the most peaceful and enduring fashion and for the benefit of all concerned. To that end, well over 1,000 leading experts in and scholars of relevant areas of knowledge have already accepted invitations to join the project, and well over 100 webinars like this one on topics related to Korean reunification have been held all around the world, of which 30 or so have been in Europe. The International Leadership Conference of which this webinar is part can be seen as a concentration and intensification of this process. Each continent is holding its own conference involving all the main areas covered by UPF. Highest level political leaders, parliamentarians, religious leaders, economists, businessmen, media professionals, academics, artists, and so on. In short, that is the vision and the thought process that has led to today's seminar. So now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished moderator for this webinar, Dr. Werner Fasselabend, who was a longtime parliamentarian in his native Austria, served for 10 years as Minister of Defence, and later as Speaker of the Austrian Parliament, and is well known, much respected and liked across the whole spectrum uh, of politics in Austria. He currently serves as Director of the Austrian Institute for European Studies. And I should add that over the last 15 years or so, he has also been a very significant contributor to a deeply valued friend an ally of UPF in Austria and all across Europe. Welcome, Dr. Faselabend. Thank you very much, Mark Brenn. Uh, I also want to welcome all the participants of this webinar. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have to be aware that uh, this is an extraordinary panel, an outstanding panel consisting out of two former prime ministers, a former a uh, foreign minister and an 18 karat expert uh, on Korean affairs. And I guess this will be necessary. Why? 
Because if you look to the map, just one short glance will make you sure that it is necessary that you work on it with the highest capabilities. Why? Because Korea, the Korean Peninsula, certainly is situated in the very epicenter of world politics. North Korea having two terrestrial neighbors, on the one hand, China, on the other side, Russia. South Korea having only one terrestrial neighbor, this is North Korea, and at the seaside, Japan. And in addition to that, you also have American bases in South Korea. And so far, it is the meeting point of interest from all the three most powerful uh, world powers. And if we want to try to discuss what can happen or what should happen in order to secure peace in this uh, specific region, what we can do, then we certainly need the highest capabilities. And insofar, it's really a pleasure for me uh, just to say hello to Yves Le Term, the former prime minister uh, of Belgium, the, to Kiel Bondevik, the former prime minister of Norway, to Karin Kneisel, the former foreign minister of Austria, and also uh, to Alexandra Shebin, this uh, high 18 karat expert, as I said, for Korean affairs from Russia. Yeah, and it is my pleasure to moderate it. I will be, uh, I will try to be very compact and I also ask all participants to try to be very compact because we will have also uh, quite a few questions at the end. And uh, my first task will be just to say a few words to our first speaker. Our first speaker is Yves Le Terme, the former pr prime minister of uh, Belgium. He was born in 1960 and he is a more very typical child uh, of Belgium, uh, of Belgian questions. His father was French speaking, his mother Flemish. And okay, so he grew up in this uh, uh, hemisphere of two worlds within one single country from ethnical, from the ethnical, from the language question and so on. Yeah, he certainly made or uh, had an outstanding career. Uh, he became not only the prime minister of one of those regions of Flanders, but afterwards also the prime minister of the whole country. And in addition to that, he had not only the experience uh, as a short time foreign minister, but also the experience of working for European Union and for OECD. And insofar, he certainly uh, is not only capable, but the best choice to start it. What is the view from the very uh, center of, European, of European politics what is the view from the Belgium, from the Brussels side? Please, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Let me start by uh, thanking uh, Mr. Bran and, and UPF uh, for having me here. Uh, congratulations also for organizing this, uh, this webinar. And of course, a hello to all colleague panelists and to all participants to this uh, important uh, webinar. So in trying to set the scene from Europe, I would say that uh, the European Union, alongside with the global community, in fact, to my opinion, has three to four very important reasons to try to be more involved in the question of reunification of Korea and pacification of the Korean Peninsula. The first reason is, of course, that uh, pacification is the best way to avoid a outbreak of a second Korean War. Uh, secondly, uh, rising tensions and a lasting failure by the international community to prevent North Korea from becoming a fully fledged nuclear power would of course harm, severely harm, 
the non-proliferation uh, in which we all have a very important interest and stake. And number three, a pacified Korean peninsula is, is key, we think, to the regional balance of power, to stabilizing the regional balance of power in, as you mentioned yourself, a crucial region, the East Asian region and the Northeast Asian region. And number four is, of course, and that should be at the heart of all efforts of all politicians always, it is the well-being of the uh, population, the uh, uh, citizens of uh, the Korean Peninsula, and more uh, specifically, more precisely, the population of North Korea. So these are four reasons why the European Union should maybe pay more attention to uh, every opportunity to have a positive uh, involvement there. In a more active engagement in that region, uh, the European Union, we think, um, could, uh, and its member states, should focus on three major elements. Number one, of course, the denuclearization and non-proliferation issue. Um, although we show understanding for Seoul that uh, tends to prioritize the reunification to the uh, denuclearization, Number two, second key point is the socioeconomic development and more specifically the development of uh, North Korea. And number three is improving the human rights situation of the, of the citizens. It is fair to say that until now, the EU and its member states have kind of been sidelined in the most important negotiations and talks like the six party talks and also in the two diplomatic tracks of talks that are going on, uh, the one between uh, Seoul and Pyongyang and between the one between Washington and Pyongyang, European Union and its member states until now have not been sitting around the table or playing an active role. Some 25 years ago, there was the very important uh, Asian strategy document. And starting from that, there were some prudent steps by the then European community and, and afterwards European Union to engage actively, to um, then shift to a more critical engagement where when the situation, political situation was worsening. And of course, at the end, uh, since 2015, due to the North Korean nuclear missiles development program, this engagement has been uh, stopped and has been, uh, has been shifting to let's say, a very critical pressure uh, putting on the North Korean uh, regime. Um, but the EU had been, uh, uh, let's say, a, an engaged partner, for instance, in the uh, uh, multilateralization of KEDO, the uh, Korean Energy Development Organization, that was a very important part of the substance of talks and was a kind of way to structure and to give content to talks between uh, the EU and the Korean Peninsula, the Southern, South and North Korean uh, authorities. And so I think that European Union has until now played a very secondary role uh, in, in the issue, but that some member states and the European Union maybe in the future could have a more important role uh, to play. I would say that maybe even more than the former EU institutions some of its member states, and I could maybe say the same of, of Norway, but there uh, the former prime minister will take the floor, uh, but that there is an interest and there is a substance also for uh, some member states to more actively engage. Um, uh, and and uh, I would say based on their involvement and political, uh, specific political uh, weight. Um, I could name uh, some of the member states like Germany, Sweden, uh, France. So I think it is very unlikely that the European Union will start to be suddenly uh, in the near future a real participant, a real partner in diplomatic talks, negotiations, or play a role as a kind of mediator or even honest broker. But I think that some member states, like for instance, Sweden, like it has done in the past already, could act also in the future as a facilitator, increase its active engagement as a response maybe of future tokens of goodwill of uh, Pyongyang, or even, and this goes for Sweden, but also for other member states of the European Union, and who knows for the, maybe for also for the European Union as a whole, let's say take up a role of being uh, not only a facilitator, but also a guarantor 
um, of obligations and promises that could be part um, from the side of the international community that could be part of negotiations and let's hope a future uh, way to have real uh, agreements uh, concerning the political tensions uh, on the Korean Peninsula. In any case, and I conclude with that, I think that at any time, the European Union and its member states should uh, continue to advocate very more actively, advocate in favor of a peaceful solution and maybe in, in a stronger partnership with other nations of the Pacific region like uh, Australia, but also uh, Asian countries should um, uh, advocate for a peaceful solution and against any military, um, more military tension like we've uh, experienced during the uh, Trump uh, era. So I leave it there. So we have a, a, let's say a secondary role, I think as European member states and European Union until now, but I think it would be good to have a bit more active involvement be it more as a facilitator than as an active participant around the negotiating table. Setting the scene, that's my contribution to your uh, debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. This was a perfect overview of uh, what has happened in the past and the relationship between EU, its uh, initiatives, its uh, strategies towards Asia, uh, and the Korean question. And it also gave us uh, quite a few very important proposals, what can be done, what should be done, what might be done uh, in order to get closer to a solution. I do not want to, uh, to go into uh, a question uh, immediately, but I would rather try maybe to go to our next panelist and uh, start a discussion afterwards. And so far, uh, I want to introduce very shortly our next panelist. It's the former prime minister, Kjell Magne Pondevik from uh, Norway. He also is a member of a Christian Democratic uh, Party. He even was a party leader as far as I know. And interestingly, he, he did not study uh, law or political science as most of the others, but theology, because as far as I know already, his father used to be a high ranking Lutheran uh, representative, uh, I think a, bish a bishop in uh, Norway. Yeah, uh, he started a party career before he became a pastor and uh, also his career made him or brought him twice into the function uh, of the prime minister and uh, insofar he, he certainly has quite some experience. Some experience uh, that is twofold, not only personal, but uh, uh, as much as Yves Le Terme has already outspoken, you know, uh, the function a single country can have, uh, due to my experience, Norway is one of the best contributing nations all over the world uh, in order to try to moderate peace processes, to facilitate, uh, maybe also to give some guarantees, as Yves Le Terme has said. Okay, so far, uh, I have to welcome to you, Mr. Prime Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, without going into history, uh, we all agree that the division of the Korean Peninsula is a tragedy. First of all, for the Korean people and, uh, and nation, but also for the region and the international community. It is a remaining part of uh, the earlier history of the conflict between the communist world and the democratic world. The ultimate uh, goal for uh, the policy of the Korean Peninsula should therefore be a reunification. Well, that is what the Korean people deserve. And we have experienced the reunification of the two German states. And it sh this should be an inspiration uh, for us, despite the conditions are, are different in Korea. People in the North also deserve 
freedom, democracy, and civic, social, and economic human rights. The Oslo Center, where I'm the founder and the current chair of the board, we contributed to a report on the human rights situation in North Korea some years ago, and the conclusions were clear. Uh, there are 200,000 political prisoners living under hard conditions in the country. There is a lack of freedom of religion, of expression and assembly. And that is also from time to time, lack of food and humanitarian assistance partly because uh, the regime has denied humanitarian organizations to reach out to people in need. I have had uh, an interest for the Korean uh, issue over the last 25 years. It goes back to the mid 90s when I was member of a parliamentary delegation from Norway visiting both North and South Korea. And uh, to travel via Beijing from north to south was to go from one world to another. It was so different living conditions. And in south, I learned um, Kim Dae-yong to know. He was at that time in opposition. Later, he was the president. And he came to Norway also for receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. And I visited him in South Korea at several occasions. Uh, I will especially remember, I will never forget, when I was there in the year 2000 and um, attended the first family reunification event between 50 people coming from the north, meeting their families in the south, and they hadn't seen them for 50 years. Um, and that was really a moving moment. As prime minister, I also visited uh, South Korea and I was up to the border to the, to the north. The question is, how sh should we meet the challenges from the north? I don't uh, think that a hard rhetoric and the pressure uh, on the regime is the way to go. I'm afraid that uh, North Korea then will isolate themselves even more. I think we have to learn from Kim Dae-yong's sunshine policy. Uh, he believed that through contact and dialogue, it's possible to make a better understanding, uh, to, to warm up the relations instead of freezing them down. And um, Kim Dae-yong uh, achieved some results, we have to remember from his policy. He was able to open up a uh, road and uh, railway between North and South. He opened up an access to uh, a tourist spot in the North from the South. Uh, they built an industry park on the Northern side with the huge investments from the South. And last but not least, they organized these family reunification events that I, uh, mention. Another approach has been the uh, six party talks that also the term uh, mentioned and focusing especially on the nuclear issue. But we know that there are no real positive outcome of uh, these efforts so far. And Europe has not been included in these initiatives. Recently, we, we know about uh, President Trump and his visit to meet uh, Kim Jong-un, but it seemed to me that uh, there were no real political preparations for these uh, talks and uh, there were no substantial outcome from them. So we know we need new initiatives. Uh, we don't know what President Biden so far think about Korea and if he will priorities this uh, issue. So the question is, could Europe, could the uh, European Union uh, take initiatives? Europe has nothing to risk if doing so. And maybe North Korea also will trust uh, the European uh, Union. If uh, Europe should take initiative, it must of course be in full understanding 
with the countries uh, in the six party talks. Uh, these countries are all, as we know, very relevant for the development uh, in the Korean Peninsula. I will especially mention one uh, possible approach. We need to be creative to find new approaches and perhaps we can learn from lessons of the past because we could think about the possible Asian conference inspired by the Helsinki process in Europe. Um, we know that the Helsinki process based on the Helsinki declaration served as a meeting place for countries in the East and West uh, in Europe before the fall of, fall of the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall. It was a meeting place. Uh, and we know that there were three baskets of cooperation within the Helsinki process. It was about economic cooperation, it was about security cooperation, and it was about human rights. And these is, are all also relevant for the Korean Peninsula. We know from experience that the North Korean mentality is hard to understand for a Westerner, yes, even for an Asian. Still, we need to work on the perception we have and invite the other side to have confidence in a dialogue. Though officially close to the outside world, there are holes in the we can call the bamboo uh, curtain and glimpses of another life uh, do slip in here and there. An Asian Helsinki process might be able to agree on measures to develop the North Korean economy and in a longer perspective guide its way into the larger international community. So um, Maybe we could consider such an approach from uh, the European side to the challenge uh, on uh, Korea with the final goal of a reunification. Thank you. I'm sorry that I have to leave you after the panelists' uh, introductions because of a virtual congress of my political party in Norway, but I'm glad that I could uh, participate so far. Thank you very much. We are very glad that you took the opportunity uh, to be together with us. And uh, I also want to thank you for your contribution, uh, which gave us not only an overview about your personal experience uh, with the two Koreas, but also uh, you also made a clear proposal. I mean, to start sort of an Asian Helsinki process uh, consisting out of three baskets. Highly interesting. Okay. Thank you very much. And I hope we can uh, engage you at least a little bit in also a further discussion process. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. And now our next panelist will be Dr. Karin Kneissel. She was born in 65 in Vienna and certainly had a very interesting career. Uh, she studied in different places. On the one hand, in Vienna, of course, at the University of Vienna, but also at the Hebraic University in Jerusalem because her father was working in Jordan as a pilot for uh, the late Jordan King. And she did not only study over there, but also then uh, had further studies at the ENA, uh, the famous Ecole Nationale d'Administration, which is in discussion uh, now by the French president. And maybe because this is not uh, a point of interest so much uh, in the future, she also studied at the Georgetown University in Washington. She became a diplomat, she became a journalist, a freelancer, and then she became uh, the Austrian Austrian foreign minister between 2017 and 2019. Now she is a freelancer again, and uh, we all are waiting for her perspective on the question of North and South and unification of Korea. Please, Dr. Karin Kneisel. 
Thank you very much, uh, Minister Dr. Fassel Abend. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for these very kind words of introduction. And also my warm uh, thanks go to uh, Mark Bren and his entire team for having so diligently prepared our meeting. Uh, and I, I have, I'm, I'm sincerely uh, proud and, and, and joyful to be part of, of today's debate. Um, when I saw the title, I, I appreciate the fact that it's Europe and not European Union. And we have ha had, uh, just had the possibility to listen to the uh, deliberations by uh, former Prime Minister of Norway. We have a guest uh, from Russia, Dr. Shibin. And uh, thereby we also have other European representatives beyond the European Union. So I would like to make it take a twofold approach and discuss on the one hand where the European Union as such can step in. And here I would really like to focus on the European Union common foreign policy as such, not so much what the one or the other member state could do, because still our effort is to really act uh, in a common way. And on the other hand, of course, also look at other European states where they might step in. And here I'm thinking also in particular of former EU member United Kingdom, <laughs> because uh, they, they also will definitely keep their eyes and ears open when it comes to the Korean Peninsula. So uh, let me start with the first track, where uh, could the European Union step in? And here I would like um, to bring into our, uh, bring to our uh, attention once again, uh, the so-called JCPOA. JCPOA uh, is the acronym for uh, the long uh, standing negotiations on an Iranian nuclear program. It's actually a nuclear disarmament uh, agreement. Uh, the JCPOA uh, negotiations started back uh, between 2003, 2005. We still had Javier Solana then uh, taking initiatives, chairing, bringing uh, Iran back to some sort of diplomatic solution. Uh, but the JCPOA really gained a momentum once direct talks had started between Washington and Tehran. And these direct talks had been uh, uh, mediated uh, by uh, the Sultan of Oman, uh, uh, the late Sultan Qaboos, by the foreign ministry of Oman. They played a tremendous role in bringing uh, US negotiators and Iranian negotiator around one table. Actually, that started um, back in autumn 2012. Uh, I, I would like to mention that because in autumn 2012, we still had uh, as Iranian president, uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad, uh, and it was not yet um, uh, President Rouhani. So uh, there was a... Um, a readiness by the United States to talk to Iran as such. Now, the, the, uh, that momentum gained uh, importance uh, with the Geneva Accord in uh, November uh, 2013. And uh, then as of July 2015, when the agreement was signed in Vienna on July 14, 2015, uh, the, United, the European Union was very proud of having this uh, success story of, uh, of, of, of efforts that you can call EU diplomacy, EU foreign policy accomplishment. And uh, so far, when we look at it as, a, as an example, as a case, it's the only one where EU foreign policy, EU diplomacy has really presented uh, an accomplished fact. Of course, the P5, uh, the permanent five of uh, the European, um, of, of, of the Security Council plus Germany have had their, their special role, but uh, the European Union, whether it was Catherine Ashton or later on Federica Mogherini as a uh, high representative had their special role. And I elaborated on the JCPOA for some time because it was closely monitored by North Korea. And when the United States decided to step out of uh, the JCPOA as of May 9th, 2018, this was one of the promises Donald Trump had made in his electoral campaign. And, and he made it happen in May 2018, saying United States moves out, withdraws from the JCPOA. Um, 
the the reaction in um, in Korea was most probably the following: Well, you cannot trust them. You, we can have meetings as uh, Trump and uh, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, chairman. Uh, Kim Jong Un had, had had, but as had been uh, discussed also before and by Yves Le Tam, without results, no political, no diplomatic uh, mm -hmm. uh, accompanying uh, measures were, were taken. So uh, now that we have again a fresh start with the Biden administration, um, I would say a serious determination to reenact the JCPOA. Things are also here on a maybe new level. Maybe there's a new dynamic. But a lot will, of course, depend on how this reenactment will be. Will we see the US really going back to the JCPOA the way they went out of it? Or will they say we want to renegotiate it? Because uh, the stumbling stone for many regional powers in the Middle East, in particular Israel, but also Egypt and several Gulf states, is um, we don't like the JCPOA because it doesn't cover at all Iran's regional role. Now, this was never on the agenda when the JCPOA was negotiated. It was really all about the nuclear program. So I, uh, what, whatever happens to the JCPOA, I would advise that we take it as a cornerstone and that we also will see how the North Koreans will, will, will act with that. Now, when it comes to, to Europe um, as a larger player, here we have countries like Switzerland, we have Norway, we have Russia. Um, some of these countries have a very dense, uh, far-reaching uh, diplomatic network. I think this is also something that counts a lot because you have to know who is doing what, what is the general atmosphere, what kind of developments might be triggered by what kind of step wherever. And uh, various EU countries lack this diplomatic uh, presence, in particular in Pyongyang. Uh, so here we should also uh, take into consideration who can, who can add uh, on, on, on that level. Uh, when it comes to Europe and European Union as, as such, to sort of put some synergy together, uh, I would say, uh, we do have a role to play because various countries in the region, and I'm not uh, thinking here now in particular only of the Korean Peninsula, are sometimes uh, confronted with the choice China or US. And uh, EU or other European countries could um, give a third alternative. So thank you very much for uh, the time and I've overused it now, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your expose. It, uh, I think, is a quite actual question uh, because the JCPOA uh, dialogue has started again in uh, Vienna now after uh, the underbreak of uh, the Trump administration. And certainly, this question of denuclearization will be a decisive question. No question. Uh, no solution without having a solution for the nuclear question, because you can imagine this is important, not only for China, for Russia as immediate neighbors, but especially also for Japan. Uh, and insofar, it is, uh, will have quite uh, an impact on future solutions. Thank you very much once again. And, uh, I will go now to our next panelist, who is uh, Dr. Alexander Shebin. She, uh, Dr. Shebin was born in 1948, not in Russia, but in Budapest, uh, due to uh, the specific situation after World War II. But he has not spent most of the, uh, his time, of course, in Russia, but also in other countries, and especially 12 years also in Korea, so he has uh, got quite some uh, personal experience, probably more than most of the Europeans uh, that occupy themselves with the Korean question. And he is now the director of the Center for Korean Studies of the Institute of Far Eastern Studies uh, within the Russian Academy of Science. Please, Dr. Shebin, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and uh, my thanks also to Universal Peace Foundation for inviting me to participate in this very important and provocative seminar, which maybe uh, can uh, open new direction for revitalizing European foreign policy uh, in very important region of Asia. Experience of more than 70 years long inter-Korean relations testifies that peaceful unification of Korea could be achieved only through the rather long period of their peaceful coexistence. During this period, economic cooperation with a certain security guarantees can play a role of a major trust building instrument. At the recent ruling party Congress, Kim Jong-un indicated that he understands the gravity of situation and urgency of addressing his people's everyday needs. The development provides world community and Europe with a new chance of engage North Korea in a mutually acceptable and beneficial way. Europe can play a significant role in Korean settlement. Europeans should keep in mind that because of certain historical and psychological circumstances, for the North Koreans, it's much easier to deal, interact, communicate with middle powers of Europe than with overwhelmingly more mighty United States. Only inviting in honest North Korea to, to participate in the realization of bilateral and multilateral economic projects in the region can convince Pyongyang that international community had taken on a road leading to North Korea gradual and peaceful integration in existing international political and economic order in the <coughs> of forcing on the country a regime change scenario. That's why Russia disagrees with those advocating postponing practical implementation of any economic projects with North Korea until nuclear problem in Korea is resolved. Those projects are important exactly because their realization not only will open new opportunities for business cooperation and economic integration in East Asia, but also will serve strengthening of confidence peace and security in the region. Regretfully, the Biden administration continues to do everything to weaken the regime economically and force it to make unilateral concessions on nuclear issue. Now it is very important to move from political statement to peaceful, to practical steps to build trust and refrain from those actions which undermine confidence. European scholars have already produced several encouraging roadmaps for greater role of Europe in the settlement on the Korean Peninsula. The recent multinational project I was personally involved uh, was called the European Union Role in Stabilizing the Korean Peninsula, published in 2019 by Elkana Royal Institute of International Relations in Madrid. Defining Europe's role in facilitating both solution of the nuclear problem and the reunification of Korea, it is possible to suggest the following. First, European Union should reestablish its high-level political dialogue with North Korea as soon as possible. This would improve the level of trust between EU and North Korea and allow EU to resume a pre-engagement policy with Pyongyang more easily. Second, persuade United States, Republic of Korea and North Korea that a dialogue is the only acceptable way for achieving both solution of the nuclear problem and the reunification. Encouraging and supporting dialogue through the EU leaders joint statements and supporting Adop adoption of related resolutions by the United Nations Security Council also will contribute to that matter. Third, share European Union vast experience in working out 
and implementing confident building measures and provide good services to North and to South. Agreement on the implementation of Pan Munjon Declaration in the military domain adopted by the North and South Korea in September 2018 contains some measures proposed by European experts, including myself at CIPRI and Center for Security Studies in Zurich as early as in 2006. This development proved that it is quite possible to adapt certain European confidence building measures to the Korean situation. Fourth, support patio lifting and softening United Nations Security Council sanctions against North Korea in accordance with the progress in denuclearization. It is high time for the European Union to recognize that denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula should be realized under the principle of simultaneous action, step by step, starting with the what we can do first and giving priority to building of trust. Necessary to exp and five, it is necessary to explore and develop not sanction fields of bilateral and multilateral cooperation with North Korea including humanitarian assistance, capacity building, technical training of North Korean personnel in various fields. The joint project initiated together by North and South Korea should get technical and technical support, financial and technical support from European institutions. Generally, Korea uh, provides a vast field for um, starting European independent foreign policy in Northeast Asia. And I wish Europeans every success in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shifin. Thank you also for uh, the positive role that you see uh, for European states, uh, middle powers, not so much the big powers due to the fact that uh, Korea is surrounded by big powers uh, that certainly have their own interests. Thank you very much for your proposals and also for stressing uh, the importance of mutual trust. This certainly will be one of the most important conditions to overcome the problems. Now uh, we're in the situation that uh, we want to have a short exchange between our panelists. We only have more or less 12 minutes or so left. And uh, I would try to ask two questions to the panelists and then just ask for, for answers. And the two questions is, the first one is uh, we ha do have a systemic rivalry, two completely different systems in the north and in the south. How do you think one could overcome, one could bridge these questions of two systems, two political, two economic systems, two systems in society? The first question. And the second one is, uh, what could be done to bring Korea a little bit out of these tensions between the big, the huge world powers. We have to be aware that the coming years maybe will even bring more tensions between uh, at least China and America. What can be done in such a situation uh, to have progress in the Korean question. These are my two questions. And now I give the floor back to the first of the four panelists who wants to give an answer to my questions. Who is the first, who will be the first? Yeah, I see already uh, Yves Leterme. Please, Mr. Prime Minister, if you start, and then, yeah, 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your questions. In the interest of time, I will be very brief on the on the two questions my, to my point of view, and only as an example of what could be done. So um, I think on your first question, it's important to grab every opportunity to uh, for, as, as a confidence building measure to grab every opportunity for people to people exchanges. And I remember that in 2017, when I was uh, heading the International IDEA Institute in Stockholm, at a certain moment, uh, Mrs. Wallström, that was then the foreign minister of Sweden, uh, she asked us to uh, provide the Swedish government in the framework of its facilitating role it was aiming at, uh, to provide it with uh, possibilities to host for seminars, for, uh, let's say, uh, experience uh, activities where, where people would experience how Western societies are organized to host, I think it was something like eight to 12 uh, young female members of the North Korean Communist Party. So this was only a very tiny little opportunity to, uh, let's say, to, to bring a little bit of uh, exchange and, and experiences from North Korean citizens to how the world looks like and how life is uh, outside of North Korea. And I think we should grab that kind of opportunities. And maybe as, as a response to tokens of goodwill in the next future, tokens of goodwill that have to be produced by Pyongyang, uh, offering possibilities for people to people exchanges would be, would be a, a way, I think, to, to build up a little bit of confidence. I remember in 2017, having had uh, conversations also with the North Korean, the then North Korean ambassador to Stockholm, and that uh, was a, a kind of ground to uh, to build up that kind of initiatives. The second one, I think, uh, your second, the answer to your second question, and, and referring to the European integration, I think that common economic projects, as soon as as uh, political circumstances allow it, and more uh, common economic projects between Seoul and Pyongyang. Uh, in the range of what has been built up over the, over the last decades, could I think uh, step by step build up uh, concrete tokens of cooperation that could maybe make uh, things uh, possible in the future. So this is very brief and not sufficient, uh, sufficiently nuanced, but given the, uh, the timeline, a uh, couple of uh, thoughts as a reaction to your question. Thank you very much. Thank you also very much for your first hand. And almost at the same time, Prime Minister Bondovic also raised his hand. And so he will be uh, number two in the row. Now, please, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, your two questions are very to the core, uh, core of the problem and challenge. Very relevant questions. And, um, um, of course, it is a challenge that we have two completely different political systems in the north and south of uh, Korea. But uh, on the other hand, I think there is a strong will among common people on both sides of the border to uh, come uh, together again and to reunite because it's the same people, it's the same nation, but it's two different states and two different systems. So. Um, we, we have an experience from uh, Germany, uh, Eastern and Western of Germany were also two very different uh, political systems uh, and they succeeded to reunite. Of course, I, I think it's even a much bigger challenge to reunite the Korean states uh, and there are differences, uh, but, um, but we have experience that it is possible to bring a, to build a bridge between two different system and to reunite. And uh, when people on both sides uh, have the will, I think it could be possible also on the Korean Peninsula, but it's not a quick fix, it will take time. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, I think an approach like the Helsinki process that went over years uh, could be a possible approach. Um, you are also right that there are tensions between the great powers uh, with regard to Korea, US, China, of course, Russia, Japan. Um, but uh, on the other, uh, therefore, I think that Europe could play a role 
uh, because uh, we can be a bridge builder also between these uh, nations that have their interest uh, in, in the Korean issue. And um, I also think that the US and China, especially, and also Russia, of course, they need some issues to cooperate on, to, to, to get positive results from. The tensions are high now between the US and China, between the US and Russia. But on the other hand, I think all these uh, countries want to find fields of cooperation and the Korean issue could be such a field of, uh, of cooperation. Yeah, thank you very much for your proposals uh, and your statement. My question is now, is there anybody else? Maybe Karin Kneisel? Yeah, yes, please. I think you have to unmute. I do not. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> thank you very much for giving me the floor. And thank you for both questions. Uh, personally, I have only traveled to South Korea and I remember subsequent to the German reunification uh, debate and what worked and what didn't work, uh, that debate was reflected uh, in a, a in the 1990s and early 2000s, when I was in South Korea, I hadn't traveled back ever then, but uh, they watched it with, uh, how should I say, a, a certain distance. Uh, and uh, so I have no idea about uh, the, the atmosphere and uh, expectations in North Korea. So it's a bit difficult for me to, to really get into this very practical issue of how you can make uh, it happened that the systemic rivalry might be overcome. Um, maybe there was a kind of momentum in the early 1990s, maybe. Uh, but I, I think that right now, while we are going into a definitely multipolar world with all what it entails, um, it will be a bit more difficult. And uh, the options uh, for the systemic rivalry are also different. I would say they are now not only this uh, capitalist versus socialist system, they, they, they go far beyond that. Uh, and uh, I agree with what the previous speaker said, as many human encounters as possible. We have all followed the, the, the pictures of this uh, intervals when, when people were allowed to meet and uh, to make it happen also as long as people are still alive. I think this is what, what counts a lot. It, it, it doesn't make any sense to make uh, uh, family members meet uh, in five or six years when, when, when most of them uh, might have disappeared. So what happened, what was undertaken a few years ago, 15 years ago, should really get its dy uh, dy dynamic before it's too late. Uh, to get the Korean Peninsula out of, of, of the overall tension, I like very much what uh, Prime Minister Bondovic had just mentioned. Yes, there are topics where the European Union, other Europe, European states and Russia and other um, uh, capitals can uh, cooperate and the Korean question might be one like that. So I, I think this, is, uh, this, this, this could be a path to be taken and not to leave it to a US-China, a Chinese-Russian, a pure, uh, whatever, Pacific agenda, uh, but uh, to, to, to bring it back to an agenda where, where we can cooperate. And what I had mentioned before, uh, I would like to reiterate, we should not underestimate the importance of a efficient diplomatic network that you have to have in both uh, capitals in Seoul and in Pyongyang. And many of the EU states, we, we, we don't have it to the same extent, uh, like, uh, like for instance, Russia has it when it comes to Pyongyang. And, and here to profit from the inside knowledge and to, to better interpret certain trends. Uh, and what Dr. Shibin has said beforehand, trust, 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 yes, dialogue. This is definitely to be rebuilt. I had one encounter with uh, the ambassador of the DPRK in, um, in Vienna when I served as minister upon the request of, uh, of one Western power. They wanted us to, 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 to speak 
and to see how things uh, could work on. And it was very clear from the part of this uh, rather high ranking official because uh, uh, the North Korean ambassador to Vienna has, I think has been now for 25 years ambassador and he's, he's, he has a tremendous insight. And he very bluntly said, uh, we don't have the trust. So this is what, 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 what Dr. Shibin said. And this absence of trust was definitely enhanced by the way the US stepped out of, of the JCPOA. So either you bring back that agreement to its full functioning track, and then you can say, well, we have negotiated that, we have an international guarantee for that agreement, and let us take it as a reference for some agreements also on, on, on uh, with, with North Korea, be it just nuclear disarmament or be it other questions. But here we really have to, to, to work on in order to re-establish credibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, okay, yeah, Dr. Shebin. Thank you. Uh, concerning the first question about the systematic enmity and distrust between North and South, uh, uh, I think that uh, we should call on both North and South Korea, first of all, to abide with the many agreements which already concluded between them, starting from the basic agreement in 1991, where it was a, a very concretely depicted various spheres of cooperation. We know that there were also five summits between North and South Korea. There were several declarations, meetings of prime ministers who mapped out a huge plan for inter-Korean cooperation. Unfortunately, we will know that uh, when the uh, liberal government and Kim, like Kim Pejun, Nomuhyun, persuade engagement. Next conservative governments mm, like uh, Limenbach and Park and He uh, uh, prefer more hardline policy towards North Korea. So our joint message to both North and South Korea should be abide with existing agreements between North and South, try to fulfill at least part of very good uh, understandings and agreements which already have been concluded by North, between you, between North and South during the last 30 years. That's our for first question. As for the second question, it seems to me that uh, both Koreas are not very lucky to take sides with any great, of great powers. It's our message should be here mostly to the great powers, not to make, not to force North, Korea, North and South Korea to take sides. We all know that South Korea now are very unhappy with the necessity to take sides between China and United States. And, uh, uh, but because of alliance obligations and other uh, circumstances, it had to do something. So it, our message here should be not so much to Seoul and Pyongyang as to Washington and Beijing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. And I want to thank uh, all of our four panelists for this short discussion. I now have to hand over uh, for the questions of uh, our participants of this webinar. Uh, before I do that, I really want to thank especially Prime Minister Bondovic, who has uh, to leave the session uh, in a few minutes because he has to go to a party conference and due to his uh, very strong links and his history uh, within the party, we of course can understand it. I really want to thank you, uh, Prime Minister Bondovic, for your contributions. It was a pleasure. And I also want to tell all the other panelists. For me, it was a political and an intellectual pleasure to follow your statements. Uh, this certainly is a highlight in, in webinars, not only on the Korean issue, uh, but on many political issues that you provided for all of us. Thank you. And now I will hand over to David Fraser Harris. Uh, he will moderate 
uh, questions from the auditory. Uh, David Fraser Harris is a Scotsman uh, working for quite some while already in the Middle East. Uh, he was responsible within U UPF for the interfaith dialogue. He was uh, localized in Rome, as far as I know, and then he spent quite some time also in Damask, uh, re being responsible for the Middle East. Please, uh, David, I want to hand over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Faslaven. Uh, it's an honor to be in the same panel with you again after uh, many previous experiences. Um, thank you to all of our uh, distinguished panelists. Um, when you've had a good meal, you probably don't want to have a lot more food, but we have a lot more questions here. So <laughs> I hope some of you are ready. Uh, I, the questions that I see, uh, quite a few have come in, um, are not really directed at individual speakers. So I'm going to ask them fairly openly and ask each of the panelists to chip in as you feel um, would be appropriate. The first question I would like to read is from a speaker from the previous panel, Mr. Claude Begley, and he makes a, a, a suggestion. He says, could we think of a team of neutral facilitators from West, some from Western countries, like for example, the EU, Norway, or Switzerland, and some from Asian origins, for example, Mongolia and Vietnam. So there it is, just a, a proposal thrown out of a, a team for negotiation, or, or rather facilitators. Um, does anybody have a thought or comment on that from our panel, or is it too general? Unmute. Unmute, please. Uh, uh, I think that the uh, initial stage of any progress in Korean settlement, uh, unfortunately, can be done only bilateral track uh, with the United States and North Korea, because North Korea is very sensitive to military threat. And military threat can be removed only uh, by United States. But if there will be any progress in, on bilateral track between United States and North Korea, the possibilities, opportunities for economic cooperation, humanitarian exchanges will be open. And in this field, and at this stage, uh, uh, middle powers of Europe and Asia can contribute a lot to the those are progress of this process. That's my short answer. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, distinguishing between an initial military stage uh, where it has to be bilateral and the opportunity for multilateral at a later stage. Um, I'd like to move on to a question that begs to be asked because of the, our absent speaker. Um, the Prime Minister, uh, former Prime Minister of Norway, proposed an Asian Helsinki process. Um, I wondered if any of the other speakers would like to comment on that. Uh, maybe Dr. Kanaiso. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman uh, Fraser Harris. Um, I listened to it carefully, and being myself uh, uh, very fond of the whole concept of uh, the Helsinki process, I'd followed it both as a student, later on as a junior diplomat, and I often come back uh, to that uh, concept. We had um, efforts in the 1990s to stretch the Helsinki process uh, to a Mediterranean dimension, to, to trigger something in the Middle East, as, as, as you know, who, who you have been working in the Middle East, there was uh, in the early 1990s, especially pushed by Italy then, um, this desire to have the Helsinki process as a larger diplomatic concept, have it repeated in the Middle East, in the Mediterranean, in the North-South relations. Even, I think there was even sometimes a suggestion to bring it uh, to the Af Sub-Saharan African continent, et cetera, et cetera. 
But uh, when you really look at it with all its pitfalls and success stories, the Helsinki process is something that you cannot stretch it as a case story to, to, to all other conflict areas. It was so particular to the confrontation of two military blocs on one continent. It was so special also the role that the N and N played, the neutral and non-aligned. If they hadn't been there, if there hadn't been this uh, uh, very small step diplomacy by, by various uh, uh, diplomats from neutral and non-aligned country, countries, uh, maybe it would have never succeeded in what it succeeded in 1975 in Helsinki. Uh, and as we know, there also was a strong opposition by the United States. Uh, the, uh, the, the, there was a huge diaspora uh, miscontent in the United States uh, to, to be too, too friendly to the Eastern Bloc as such. So still it worked. Uh, President Ford said, let's give it a chance. And, and there was this ice breaking uh, momentum in, in 1975, <clears throat> which, which, which still plays a tremendous role in my eyes, also for what happened then in 1989, that it happened the way it could happen. But I don't see the Asian um, Helsinki process as such being copied on, uh, on the CEC. We, we, we should never push analogies too far. I think the Korean peninsula merits its own uh, handling and uh, Dr. Shibin has pointed out the long list of agreements that have already been done. So we don't start from zero, there's no clean slate. Uh, one can work on something. Uh, and uh, that's why personally I'm a bit doubtful about an Asian Helsinki, even so I have always been in deep admiration of the Helsinki process as such. Thank you. Uh, I think Dr. Shibin wants to add in something. I get a couple of words. First of all, uh, there are two big differences between Northeast Asia and Europe. Uh, we had no mutually recognized borders in Northeast Asia and uh, no mutually recognized governments. In Europe, Helsinki process became possible because everybody recognized each other and we have recognized borders. But in Northeast Asia, we have territorial disputes between even allies uh, like uh, South Korea and Japan and uh, between South Korea and uh, China and Japan and China. So, and uh, uh, North Korea uh, consider that their state represents interest of the whole Korean nation. At the same time, South Korean constitution says that territory of Republic of Korea is the whole of Korean Peninsula. So we have no mutually recognized governments and borders in Northeast Asia. And that's a big problem for any process which will be similar or resembles the Helsinki process. Uh, and of course, we should uh, initially start with a normalization of bilateral relations between the states of uh, Northeast Asia. Thank you. Um, I have a question for former Prime Minister Le Pen. Uh, I will read it as it is. What does the Prime Minister of Belgium think about the deepening of cooperation between South Korea and Japan? Is that possible, taking into account the issue of Dokdo? Um, the issue of? Uh, yes, I'm puzzled too. I was hoping you might know. Doctor. Doctor. Um, I'm not familiar with that. Very sorry for that, but... Uh, it's an yeah. island. Uh, uh, it's an island between, North, between uh, Korean Peninsula and Japan. Island which uh, claim both Japan <coughs> and South Korea and North Korea. And by the way, it's one of the foreign policy issues, international use issues which North Korea and South Korea take the same position. <laughs> I'm very sorry, but I only uh, take the floor when I have a bit of uh, understanding experience and insight in teams. And so I would like to apologize towards the person that asked the question, but I have no particular 
particular view. And I only can add that when I was chairing the European Union, when Belgium had the, we had the presidency of the European Union, one of the big results was that we could uh, finalize the, uh, <clears throat> the trade deal, the, um, the comprehensive trade deal with, uh, with Korea. And that during these talks, we have been uh, trying also to, let's say, to um, uh, not to facilitate, but to draw the attention of our uh, say partners in negotiations um, on the issue of improving relations in the whole of the region. And for instance, between uh, Korea and Japan. And uh, I think it's indeed a, a matter where European Union could play a positive role. But I leave it there. I have no further insight in the issues concerning the specific island uh, Mr. Jibin was commenting. So I, I leave it there. Very sorry. No, thank you. Um, as you can see, we have a distinguished panel and some of the others have stepped in right away. Um, but I would like to ask another question, which comes from this one from Russia, um, addressed to somebody in the EU. Um, from Valentina Slepstov, I have the name. What does the EU expect from Russia regarding the reunification of the Korean Peninsula? So what does the EU expect from Russia? Um, would anybody like to step up for that one? Dr. Mm -hmm. Kneisel. Thank you very much. I, I, I will try. I've already now been out nearly two years of the uh, council meetings of foreign ministers and definitely Korea has been on the agenda ever since again. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I must say, uh, we, we are more bogged down in a, in, 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 in a kind of speechlessness uh, in our relations with Russia than, than should be the case. So um, as uh, it had been pointed out before, and I like this idea a lot, that uh, working together on the Korean Peninsula issue would open certain gates in the stalemate that we have currently in the relations between the EU as a whole and the Russian Federation, between several EU member states and the Russian Federation. I think that makes a lot of sense to use such a topic, which, um, is, uh, is of different sort than when we talk about uh, uh, energy exports, imports, mm -hmm. than when we talk about other issues that are now closer on the agenda. So I think that that, that would make sense. And then to expect something, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's to make use of the expertise. Um, there, there's a different expertise uh, for historic reasons. Uh, there's a different expertise because there's a strong diplomatic presence and, and, and also business presence on the Korean Peninsula by the Russians. So uh, uh, when one can could make use of insight. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to see which one would work next. Uh, this coming G7 that will happen in June, is there some chance that we could tackle the reunification of South and North Korea at the G7? I don't really know if that's a relevant question. Does somebody have a response? Yes, Dr. Jevin. Uh, you know, recently uh, uh, G7 uh, adopted uh, only declaration in condemnation of North Korean nuclear problem. But if uh, uh, G7 finally add to such a routine uh, declaration uh, that support for Korean unification, it will be certainly a step forward. Because <clears throat> until now it was a condemnation, but we also should encourage uh, uh, attempts by North and South Korea uh, to uh, come closer, to find accommodation, to reconciliate. I was, uh, frankly speaking, uh, surprised that 
uh, EU and the other Security Council, United Nations, paid so much attention to the uh, nuclear problem and the uh, contradictions between North and South. But when North and South um, organized three summits during one year, 2018, there was no declaration from any major international organization like Security Council, European Union, or other in support of this positive trend in North-South relation. I think we deserve, uh, and North Koreans and South Koreans deserve some support from international community, those steps which can lead to reconciliation, to cooperation, to peaceful dialogue. And that was exactly what happened in 2018. Thank you. Um, well, <clears throat> actually, I have come to the end of <clears throat> the time I was given. I have to apologize to the many other questioners who sent in questions. I've tried to do my best and represent you. Um, but I'd like to again thank our various panelists and pass the floor or the microphone uh, back to our moderator as we move to the closing parts of our event. Dr. Faslavin, uh, the floor goes back to you. Yeah. Thank you very much for handing over the moderation. I also want to apologize uh, to all the participants. I can imagine that there are many questions uh, still open and people interested. And this just brings me to the point that, of course, we should continue this discussion uh, because what I could take out was that it's not only highly interesting, but maybe also very, very important, not only for Korea, but also for relationships between big powers. And insofar, this should not be the end of the discussion. Uh, now, I just want to thank our organizer, Mark Bren, and uh, also give him the opportunity maybe to say a few words. Mark Bren, uh, I had the privilege to know him uh, already for some years. He is a British lawyer and a British lawyer you can trust. He has not only been working in big prominent law firms, but also he has opened his own business and he has become, uh, first of all, the Secretary General of UPF uh, Europe and the Middle East for quite some years. And now he's the vice chair of UPF uh, Europe and the Middle East. Please, Mark, uh, if you take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fosselabend. I'm just trying to adjust my screen here. Excuse me one second. Yes, first of all, uh, Thank you very much to our distinguished speakers this morning for all the wisdom and insights that you've been able to provide us with on this very important topic. And thank you, Dr. Fasilavan, for your very capable moderation of proceedings. My main reflection, having listened to all the panelists' presentations, is that there are really quite a few suggestions made that we really should follow up on with a view to exploring them further on, on future webinars. Ideas that should not just be allowed to uh, stay in people's minds, but maybe we should action in some way further in the future. I'm very grateful for that. Um, from a UPF perspective, the importance of a peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula cannot be overestimated. That is why UPF and its affiliated organizations have invested hugely in North Korea over the last 40 years and more in major buildings like the Premier Hotel in Pyongyang, the Potonggang Hotel, in giving North Korea, its car industry, in cultural and sporting exchange, exchanges, and also much else. Father and Mother Moon are two of the very few internationally known figures to have visited the North, of course, which is where they originally came from, and to have met Kim Il-sung in 1991. A strong and enduring relationship has resulted between the two families that exists to this day, such that UPF's co-founder, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, has a standing invitation to visit the North at any time. And she will do so just as soon as the South Korean government gives such a visit its blessing. Furthermore, UPF's founder's vision of and strategy for an undersea tunnel between Japan and Korea is fast gaining traction 
in South Korea particularly, and was recently given the public support of the new mayor of Busan, where the tunnel will reach Korean soil. When constructed, the tunnel stands to help in many ways to build cooperation between the three key nations of Korea, Japan, and China. UPS perspective is based on the fact that over the last 40 years, there's been a fundamental shift occurring between the Atlantic civilization centered on the relationship between the United States and Europe, and Europe in that case primarily refers, I guess, to the United Kingdom, that has been the primary moving force in world affairs uh, for the last several generations. To the Pacific Rim civilization centered predominantly on Northeast Asia, which means predominantly Korea, Japan, and China. It is vital from our point of view that in Europe, we fully recognize all the implications of this fundamental shift and move to embrace it and work with it. This should mean doing everything we can to help promote peace in that region, including our cooperative union between those and other na those uh, three nations and other nations centered on democratic values and respect for human rights. And of course, many of the suggestions that have been made by our panelists this, uh, this afternoon uh, would uh, fit into that category. That is an area in which Europe has a lot to contribute to Northeast Asia. We should remember that Korea is not a nation that has any long established democratic tradition. Only in the last 40 years, guided by the tenets of Protestant Christianity that came to Korea from Europe by the United States, has it fully adopted a democratic system. The same can happen with other nations in the region also. And of course, I'm referring there by mentioning Korea to South Korea. If we can help build the culture of the Asia Pacific in this and other ways, we will also help ensure our own prosperity because the economic potential of a newly reunited Korea is vast and even more so is uh, that of a peaceful Northeast Asia. The Sea of Japan stands to become the center of global trade and industry. In short, Europe has a lot to give Asia through helping reunification of, uh, on the Korean Peninsula, but also much to gain. And we should make sure that we are ready to accept the challenges that this will entail. And I believe that the contributions of our speakers uh, on this webinar will uh, go a considerable way to helping in that regard. So thank you very much to all of our distinguished panelists and also to you, Dr. Fussell Avent, and uh, back to you. Yeah, thank you very much for your statement. And uh, now I would like to ask uh, our panelists for a few words, concluding remarks before we meet <coughs> our session. And may I start maybe this time uh, with Alexander Shebin, if you uh, give us your concluding remark. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It was a, a great honor for me to participate with such prominent European politicians and former statesmen. And I hope uh, that uh, uh, Europe will be more active on North Korean direction, especially because, uh, as I said, uh, Europeans uh, very often underestimate uh, the position and their possible role in Korean settlement because for North Koreans um, to deal with Europe, and I know uh, by my experience, uh, very often much easier, much um, uh, acceptable than deal even with a, uh, given, deal with a United <coughs> States or even China, which are too big, too overwhelmingly more mighty for them. And uh, Europeans, as they proved already for many decades, can play very positive uh, role in uh, um, promoting uh, North Korean uh, economy to promote uh, North Korean society to become a more modern society, which is a uh, can uh, integrate in the modern uh, political economic realities of the uh, current world and became a uh, normal state in East Asia. So I wish Europeans every success in their uh, oriental endeavors, especially concerning Northeast Asia. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Shebin, for 
uh, not only uh, the contents of your contribution, but also for the very constructive way you did it. And I think this was so important because uh, you did not come out of politics, but uh, out of the field of uh, academics. And thank you so much for your really worthwhile contributions. Now, please, uh, Karin Kneissel, if you follow. Thank you. While, while listening to Dr. Shibina, I've been thinking, what could I now add to all what has already been stated, which would be of some sort of added value? <coughs> Uh, I don't know whether it's true, but I was told by an interpreter in the United Nations once upon a time that the Korean language being part of the Altai languages is also connected to the languages uh, Finnish and Hungarian. Uh, so Dr. Shebin says yes. And here we see that language made the contact. Uh, People migrated from the Altai mountains. Some families, clan structure said, well, we, we write south. We think that over there on the Korean peninsula, we can make a living for future generations. <clears throat> and continued to write uh, west. Uh, and uh, some stopped uh, in Uzbekistan. Others went north to Finland. And uh, finally, some became our neighbors uh, in Hungary. Uh, so uh, there's this language connection that uh, the Finno-Ugurik Altaic languages, they form one language family. And that might be a little indication that, uh, yes, there is an old contact going across Eurasia. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your contributions, but also for the re realistic side you brought in. Uh, people, or many people say, this is very specific for ladies, you know, to be maybe a little more, be more realistic than men. And uh, it seems to me you proved it a little bit, might be a prejudice, <coughs> who knows. And so uh, thank you very much. And now uh, we ask great statesman, Yves Letem, if you give us your concluding remarks, please. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much again to uh, UPF for having been part of this uh, webinar, which was very interesting. I think it is uh, an excellent idea to draw the attention of Europeans on the issue of the reunification of the Korean Peninsula. I would add as a Belgian and as a European that um, Korea, South Korea, I think is over the last 30, 40 years, the most outstanding example worldwide of economic development, social economic progress. And so I think this should motivate us, this should inspire us to make it possible that this fantastic example of progress and of uh, developing to a wealthy nation in such a short time could be shared with the citizens of North Korea, um, also in a spirit of freedom and regained um, uh, observing of uh, human rights. So that's all, that's my wish. So thank you for having had the opportunity of being part of this uh, fruitful exchange. We carefully took note of the recommendation by Dr. Zebin saying that the European Union should look more carefully into this matter and be more involved. I hope that we can uh, bring this recommendation to uh, the people that now have responsibility. And I think it's a uh, it's a very right recommendation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for your contribution. Also for the creative side of uh, your proposals. And I now just want to say a very short word to this fantastic panel. It was the pleasure, not only of the day, but of the week uh, to be together with you to listen. Uh, and it certainly was quite an experience, I guess, for everybody uh, to hear the proposals uh, to go into this discussion on one of the most difficult issues in world politics. Of course, we have to be aware. Uh, this cannot be solved just by words. Uh, there is not the one trial that can bring the solution, but it probably will be a permanent process for quite a while. And so what we need is realism on the one hand, 
but also visions and creativeness. Creativeness in order to build up trust and to go into specific steps that bring the two sides together. Thank you very, very much. It was quite an experience to listen to this outstanding statesman and academics. It was a pleasure for me and I guess uh, I also have to thank you in the name of the whole auditory. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to a next time. Thank you and thank, thank you. UPF and especially Mark Brennan because I can, I can imagine that maybe he will sleep uh, tonight a little bit better than last night. All the best to you. Have a nice, a nice weekend and hopefully meet you sometime soon again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.